Good morning. I'm having one of those mornings where my mouth is staying dry. So you'll see me probably drink from this cup of water quite a bit, I'll be honest, this morning. Um, and that's odd for me, I'm not a water drinker. I honestly despise it. My wife tells me I should do otherwise and drink more of it, but I just don't. So this morning we're going to start out in Titus 1, 1 through 4, if y'all would open up to that, and we'll read from that, and we'll start this time looking into his word with prayer. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, in the hope of eternal life that God who cannot lie promised before time began. In his own time, he has revealed his word in the preaching with which I was entrusted by the command of God our Savior. To Titus, my true son, in our common faith, grace and peace from God, the Father of Christ Jesus, our Savior. Join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time that we gather together to come and open our arms, ears, and hearts to you, God. We pray it's just allow us just to enter into this moment and this peaceful time to search for the answers that we may not have been searching for. Things come to us when we come to you, God. You allow us to see things and hear things and be a part of things that we never thought we would be a part of, God. Pray it's just be at this during this time as we take, a, take this short period of time out of this amazing week you have before us to congregate together and to hear your word together before we go out and we do it on our own this week. I pray it's in your son's name. Amen. So one thing that between the many, several different times I've been here um, to fill in has been that y'all are on y'all's, um, are continuing y'all's search for uh, a pastor. And that's great. I'm glad y'all are doing that search and that it's working towards where it's going to be at. That's great. But one thing is that all that happens is that leads to a lot of changes, a lot of ideas that... Um, at times may have you questioning yourself or questioning those around you. And um, these questions come up um, when you have new members. Um, how committed are these people? How receptive, receptive are they to our changes? And do, um, do we really know what they believe as new members come in as we have a new pastor take over? Um, and then one of them is how do we get everyone involved? In ministry and if you've heard some of the others that I've talked of times I've been here I've preached about getting volunteers making sure everyone's on board because that is an important thing I even myself this morning I had already prepped this and gone through this and I'm sitting here going this sounds too much like another sermon I've preached and it worried me at first. I was like, it's not. I, I know it's not the exact same thing I've preached. I even went back and looked over my last several sermons I did with y'all just to make sure because I still had this worry in the back of my head. But, it, uh, but it's important things to remember. That's why you hear them over and over, at least from me, because they're important things that I, I see in ministry we need to have in the church. Um. As being an individual that was um, volunteer to part-time youth ministry to full-time youth ministry and now back to volunteer, I see it slightly different than some others have. I've been on all sides of it, been in and out, all over the place. And some of these things just come to mind whenever I think about where our church is going and um, what they're looking for in the near future. The questions that need to be addressed um, whenever a church begins to grow, which is what I believe y'all are wanting from a new, new leader, correct? Um, you would like to grow and you'd like to reach this community and reach them with, um, to help 
fix the needs or really reach them with the needs that you see that they need in this community. And what we've got here at this letter to Titus from Paul is he's at a church in Crete, which is an island in the Mediterranean. Um, most likely this congregation was started um, by someone who had been converted shortly after, um, well, they'd been converted to the gospel of Jesus um, when Peter probably had proclaimed the gospel the day during the times of the Pentecost. And that was just seven weeks after Jesus had ascended back to heaven. And the church of Crete was growing, and so the Apostle Paul sent a young man named Titus, this individual that we see him writing to, to help oversee the church, help them set things in order. And the book of Titus um, is a letter from Paul giving Titus encouragement and instruction on how to help the people to conduct themselves in God's church. So Titus is a letter, plainly, um, speak, plainly speaking, it is a letter. And um, he's, Paul here, he's speaking of what God desires his church to be. And so we get from the very beginning of his letter, Paul emphasized to Titus the importance of the truth. And that is extremely important. Paul recognized in his own life that he was a servant. From the very beginning when he came to Christ, um, in, you know, first he saw Christ, came to Christ at the house... But he knew that the knowledge of truth, he knew that the knowledge of truth led to godliness. And that we serve a God who does not lie. And Paul saw that he himself, as well as Titus, had been entrusted to tell this. To speak this out. To deliver this to all those that would hear their preaching. And this is a foundational value for all of us, for everyone in the church, and we have to understand that. I believe that the task of the, of the church is simple, very simple. God wants us to plant his seed, um, which is his word, in, anywhere we can, in everyone we see, so that we'll see growth as much as possible. A farmer doesn't plant just one seed and pray that it grows. He plants it tons of seed. Some doesn't grow, some do grow. We get that even from... Um, the stories of Christ. The church's primary mission is to spread the true gospel of Christ. But there's a temptation with this task that we have to overcome. Um, this temptation is watering down the message. Accommodating to the culture of um, not just even the city of Crane, but the state of Texas and even the country the United States and the world. We see everything changing. We see it, a lot of times we actually see it changing for the bad right now. A growing church tends to get bigger and their target um, people then become this, all these people that begin to flow into the building. And the problem is, is there's times that um, those that we target disagree with the message. And America has rapidly spiraled downward from Christian culture to post-Christian culture, and now they're becoming an anti-Christian culture, if you pay attention to what's going on in our society. Today, if you dare to say that Jesus is the only way to heaven, that homosexuality, homosexuality is a sin, and that God created the world, that abortion is taking of, of human life, and that fathers are to lead their homes, then you will be radically oppressed by the world. Nobody likes to face a lot of criticism, so we're tempted to avoid the issues and change the message altogether. And that's where our problems begin. But this temptation can, can come from within the church as well. Not just as an individual, but from the church. Because growth means that something will change. And that's what happens so many times. We should never change our message, though. When a church begins to grow, the message doesn't change. It stays the same. It's been the same for generations. It's been in this book for years. Translated from scrolls and tablets. What should change, though, are our methods. The ways that we reach out to people with this gospel. Paul said, I became all things to all men so that I might win some. We can... Ex we can expect to reach our community with the ancient gospel of Jesus Christ. What we cannot expect to reach our community with is um, methodologies, 
from 1970s, 1950s. Um, because as we've heard, er, ha, as I've already said earlier, our culture has changed, our methodologies should change as well. Even just since I was in youth 15 years ago, everything has changed. Youth ministries don't act the same as they did then th that they do now. And some people want to keep those ministries the same way. And students themselves don't necessarily want a ministry where it's all fun and games. They, they, want, they want to be taught. When you get deep down and you start discussing with them, they don't just want to come and have fun games. Yeah, that's nice every so often. But that's a change. But once changes begin, some people get upset. I've seen that firsthand. I've upset plenty of people at my first full-time ministry position. I changed quite a few things. Um, went from nearly every Sunday wanting to have game nights on Sunday evenings to us going, well, what's the point of Sunday night if that's all it is? We're going to cancel Sunday night. We'll focus that time on leadership ministry. That upset people. Whenever you do things like that to help grow a ministry, you're going to upset some people. It's going to happen. They feel threatened mainly by the changes. Whenever things change in your day-to-day -day life, the first thing you go is, oh, how's this going to affect me? This is going to change what I do. This is going to make me do this differently. And you, feel, you begin to feel threatened. But the truth is, is that we can't continue to operate by the old methodologies um, just because they're comfortable. Or because we feel threatened, or that because that we want to feel like we need to leave at that point. Or even if someone says, you know what, I'm going to withhold financial support, that money. I'm going to withhold that from the church. The temptation then is to stay away from the truth that might stir up these hard feelings for folks that need to hear it. The source of truth, the dilemma that we must deal with is how do you determine what is truth and what is untruth? What determines what is right and what is wrong? Our country is divided over all kinds of moral issues, um, wars, on terror, pornography, abortion, sexuality, and gambling, just to name a few. Nobody knows how to determine right from wrong. Some say that um, moral judgment should, should, should be based on your feelings. If it makes you feel good, it's good. If it makes you feel bad, nah, it's not good for you. That's what they say. Not necessarily the best way to look at moral issues, though. Others would say that you follow what intelligent people or even famous people set, the, the set for a standard in that day for morality. The problem is, is that um, there's a disagreement between these folks as well. And even more so, they change their morals from day to day. Or even hour to hour sometimes on what is right and what is wrong. If you ever watch the news, um, even more so during election season, you see which of the people is right and which of them is wrong, and it's different on both or any, uh, any of the stations, really. It changes the views of these morals, the moral views of these individuals, the way we're being taught them are different. Many, should even, many even say that we should let majority opinion decide on this issue and just take a vote and let popular opinion be the rule and guide for our moral issues proverbs in the book of proverbs we get verse four, chapter 14 verse 12 says there is always there is a way that appears to be right but in the end leads to death just remember that the majority in germany favored hitler at the time he was in charge. He did actually win an election to be in charge. He didn't just force himself there. He won an election. People liked him. They voted him in as popular vote. Did that, instant, did that instantly make him morally right? No. 
But if we went by the standards that have been begin to been, I am having talking problems today, that have begun to be pushed in this society now, that would be perfectly fine because oh, the majority agreed. That's the way it works. And even others say that we should just let everyone decide for himself, herself, on what is right and tolerable for them. And just let everyone choose their own beliefs. If I believe it's okay to drive while intoxicated, should you just tolerate that or that belief? Or do you just have, do you have the duty to persuade me otherwise? That would be a thought that someone would have. Some people believe it's okay to do things like that, whether it be um, drinking and driving, using drugs and driving. You see that on the news. That's why we have major accidents happening in Odessa and Midland to this day. People believe it's okay. Someone hasn't persuaded them otherwise. And some people say we should just tolerate every belief. Be very, um, be very tolerant. And it's, when we get to where we disagree, we just suddenly become extreme intolerant. We have a very intolerant um, thoughts towards people. Paul points out in Titus 1-2, he says, In hope of eternal life that God cannot lie promised before time began. We also get a passage from Numbers, way back in the New Testament. Numbers 23-19, it says, God is not a man, that he might lie or a son of man, that he might change his mind. Does he speak and not act or promise and not fulfill? When you're a member of the body of Christ, you have a definite source of truth that does not change. It's not a majority opinion or a personal feeling that you have in that day and moment. If it if, um, is the person of Jesus Christ, God's truth, it is that is being demonstrated in your life. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. He told Pilate in John 18, 37, in fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. But Jesus didn't just claim to be the truth. He proved his claim by coming back from the dead, by raising up from the grave, and easily, and it's easy for him to walk around and be able to state the truth when he is the truth, when he is all about God and humanity. Jesus did more than just teach. He came back from the dead. He prophesied about himself. Even in Matthew 12, 40, he says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Paul said in Acts 17, 31, For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. The source of truth is God. He best demonstrates the truth in his Son, Jesus Christ, and God's truth is best communicated in the Bible. In Proverbs 35, it says, Every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in Him. Psalms 33, 4 says, For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all He does. John 17, 17, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Think about the importance of truth. Why is truth so important to us? Why does it even matter? In Titus, we see the Apostle Paul emphasizing the connection on being truth and meaningful living. Or truth living and meaningful living. Um, it gives meaning to life. Truth gives you a purpose in life. Paul's purpose in life was to be a servant 
an apostle of God. Paul was going to do whatever the Lord wanted him to do to reach whoever he wanted him to reach. God's truth led us to godliness, to being more like God. It leads us to godliness. Paul wrote in 1 Titus 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a servant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. We're told that truth leads to godliness. So what happens when you water down that truth? When you change the truth slightly to fit a culture or society? It begins to no longer lead to godliness. No longer leads us to the God that's being worshipped in the original passages. You're creating something new that shouldn't be created. God's truth builds character in our lives. It builds us up. It changes us. So let's say you're visiting L.A. Your flight arrived late in the evening. You rent a car and drive from, air, from the airport looking for your hotel. However, you take a wrong turn, and after a few minutes, you realize you're lost. Then, to make matters worse, your car runs out of gas. Here you are, downtown L.A., out of gas, lost. You look out your window, and you see three huge guys walking towards you. You begin to panic. But what if you knew these guys had just left a Bible study? How would that change your feelings? So, God's truth enhances your character? It changes how people think about you? How you might even think about yourself? God's truth also gives us hope for eternity. It provides hope for the eternity that is to come. And that's what Paul tells us in verse 2. He talks about a faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life. Have you ever heard that God won't give you more than um, you can handle? It's not an, an appropriate saying. Um, I, I remember when I came to the shocking realization that um, though it's a common phrase, it's not found anywhere in the Bible. Whenever I was younger, I found that really crazy. I'm like, how many times have I heard that? So we are promised that in facing temptation, God will provide a way of escape. But in everyday life, there isn't a verse that says God won't give you more than you can handle. So please understand, I do believe God will provide for our needs and that he is more than enough to sustain us from day to day. But what needs to sustain us through the difficult times is hope that we have eternal life. Not just the hope that this time won't be difficult or that something will come along and make this easier. That's not where our hope should be. Our hope should be in the eternal life that is to come. That there is something better waiting for us. The knowledge of the truth gives us hope. Knowing the truth also depends on our relationships. Paul addresses to us a letter in the letter of Titus, on verse 4, it says, To Titus, my true son in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. The truth makes our relationships deeper. In knowing the truth of Jesus, we put others ahead of ourselves. We are not just acquaintances. We are brothers and sisters in the family of God. That is what Paul is calling Titus here. You are my brother in Christ. The truth improves our personality. It gives us grace and peace from God. Some people get cranky as they get older. As they get older, they start to worry more. But that should not be true of Christians. Christians should come should become more graceful and peaceful as they age because they have hope that has been sustained and grow and has grown within them. A missionary to a group of um, Indians in Oklahoma years ago told of driving to an old shanty where an elderly Indian sat in a rocking chair on the front porch. He called out to her and said, Ma'am, are you all alone? She just grinned and said, It's just me and Jesus, son. 
Just me and Jesus. The truth is important. It gives us a sense of purpose. It improves our character. It gives us hope. It deepens our relationships. It improves our personalities. The truth is what the world needs. The responsibility of truth. This is very important. Satan doesn't have to get the church to reject truth. If he can get us to reduce it, water it down, change it slightly here and there, his job is being accomplished. He's, um, he says, tell the, tru- the, tell the truth, just don't tell all of the truth and avoid those parts that might upset people. Just be tolerant. If you think about what Satan's trying to push our way, that's what he's trying to push our way. He's trying to push for us to change our beliefs in such a way that they no longer line up with God's word. They're no longer leading us to godliness because it's no longer the truth. Be tolerant. I can't tell you how many times I've heard those words in these last several years. We are to be as loving, merciful, and gracious as possible As much as we can be, we need to be those. But we must not shy away from the truth. In fact, we have been entrusted with this amazing, great responsibility. According to Ephesians 4.15, we're to speak the truth in love. Satan has another scheme that follows here. It's to convince us that we never have to speak the truth at all. He tells us that if we'll, well, just live the way we're supposed to, then we should never have to proclaim the gospel because people will be convinced because of our lifestyle. I know I've heard that one many times. If you just live as you follow Christ, others will see how you live and see the way that things have changed for you. The problem is, is, They don't see your inside. They don't see how it's affected you in so many other ways. They just see how you might have changed a few things. And honestly, to someone looking in from the outside, they go, wait, they lose some of their free time. They now have to go to church on Sundays. They now do this, and they now volunteer here, and they do this and that. Wait, how is this better for me? If you're just living the lifestyle, they're going to question it still. That's not our job. Romans 10, 14 says, How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? Big emphasis on the heard. And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Jesus is our example in all of these things. His example was both living out and proclaiming the truth. They go side by side like like train tracks hauling the train down the road. Our lifestyle and our preaching should carry the message of Christ to all. Can't have one or you derail the train, folks. You have to have both. So in that instance, you can't just preach it and not live it out, and you can't live it and not preach it. Have to be together. We have a responsibility to the truth, and that is to simply share it as is. No changes, no redactions. It's not supposed to be a CIA file that's got all these black lines through it. The good, the bad, and the ugly is all there. What happens when you don't believe is all there. That's the bad. The good, though, is that we have a Savior that was sent for us to believe in, to bring us back from death, give us life through salvation. In verse 3 of Titus 1, it says, In his own time he was re- revealed, in his own time he has revealed his word in the preaching of with which I was entrusted by the command of God, our Savior. So 
So he's been entrusted. But the thing is, is Paul is not the only one that's been entrusted to share the, God, the word of our Lord and Savior. If I were to send a letter by the U.S. mail, it is the Postal Service's job to deliver that letter just the way I sent it. They're not to change it, alter it, add to it, take away from it. I don't care how the post office gets it to where I'm sending it. They can send it by airplane, truck, by foot, or ironically enough, I saw they sent one by a missile one time from North Carolina to Florida this last week, back in the, like the 50s. Made it in there in like 10 minutes. Just thought I'd throw that in. They don't care how they send it. But they're supposed to deliver it exactly as I wrote it. So God, he has entrusted us. We are his postal service. We are the ones that are supposed to go out day in and day out, rain or shine, and share his message. We're to deliver it to the world. We can use different methods, different methodologies. We can, um, different, we can use different music, different buildings, and even different programs. But the message, the truth, has to stay the same. In spite of knowing this, churches are tempted to water down the message and to change the truth. They're inclined to add to it, take away, make it different. There are seminaries that once stood firm in their basics of the gospel, but now they question the validity of the Bible. Some denominations have changed the wordings to familiar prayers or hymns so they won't sound chauvinistic. Instead of our Father who art in heaven, it becomes our Father and Mother or our Creator. Local churches stop talking about sin so they won't offend people. They simply just present Jesus as a good friend who can make them wealthy and happy. During the Revolutionary War, a group of soldiers camped out at a field near, the farm, near a farmhouse. It was cold. The soldiers needed wood for a fire. Their officer in charge saw a wood rail fence. He knew the men needed to keep warm, but he also wanted to respect the owner's property. So he told his men they could take off the top run, rung of the fence, but only the top rung for firewood. When the officer woke up in the morning, he found that the fence was completely gone. It was all the way down to the ground. Yet not, yet not one soldier disobeyed his order. They had all just taken the top rung. When we lose the, principle of the principles of the scripture, there is nothing to hold back the evil of the world. Why is it such a strong temptation to water down the truth? Why is it hard to stand firm? I think one reason is our, our own pride. We get prideful. The world is making a, um, has a way of making people who stand for, absolute, um, for absolutes to look ignorant or uneducated. We don't want to appear out of touch. So we just adjust our theology. So we can continue to keep our pride so we don't seem out of touch or different. Another reason we do this is that we think um, it will appeal to more people if we make it a little less um, difficult to chew, I guess. Because God's word isn't easy to take, take a bite of and chew at times. It, it can really get at you. So if we water it down, we thin it out, it becomes easier to chew. We're afraid that the truth is too demanding on the people. But actually, it's the opposite. People want the real thing. You never go to a store trying to buy um, a knockoff to the same thing you came to the store of. If you came to, let's see, you go to a store to buy... Um, Snap-on tools, you're going to buy snap-on tools. You're not going to buy um, a brand that's been faked to look like snap-on tools. They're not going to have the same quality. It's not going to have the same integrity. It's not going to have the warranty behind it. It's not going to be worth as much. 
Same is true for God's word. When we water it down and we change it, it doesn't have the same integrity. It doesn't have the same strength. It doesn't have the, um, I guess the warranty here would be his, the salvation and the truth is godliness. When we don't have that, we have a problem. The truth of, of all things is appealing when it's lived out with integrity. That's why it's important for the church to stand firm for the truth. That each one of us preach and teach and tell God's truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. That each one of us who claims to follow Jesus Christ lives out God, lives out God's truths in everyday life. The, and that position, um, proposition only means that um, who calls this church their home. So it comes down to this. How do we do that? How do we live out our responsibility to God's truth? So I'm going to share um, six very brief thoughts on that matter. Six very brief thoughts. First of all, be discerning. Don't accept things as truth just because it comes from the stage or from a Sunday school teacher. You have a responsibility. And that responsibility is to make sure that what you are being taught lines up with the Word of God. Have to do that. Acts 17 11 says, tell, uh, tells us that Christians and Berea were of more noble character than Thessal Thessalonians, for they received the message with great earnest, eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. They didn't just hear it from Paul, they also then went back and they said, Let's find it. Where did it come from? What's it really mean? Is he saying the same thing that it was being said here? You have to do that. If the Apostle Paul had to be checked on his own preaching, um, you know that every other preacher needs to be as well. Every other preacher needs to be checked and discerned. Second, be supportive. If you see that the church is doing its best to speak the truth, then do whatever you can to help so it can even be more successful. Third, be studious. Paul told Titus that a knowledge of the truth leads to godliness. Don't be satisfied to sit in your seat and swallow once a week when, when you're being spoon-fed the scripture on Sundays. Learn to study on your own so that you can grow at a more rapid rate. Let's put that miracle grow on the plant and let it grow. Let it get strong. God's Word allows you to grow. Fourth, be courageous. When you have opportunities at work, school, in your community, speak up for the truth. Don't be afraid. Don't apologize for it either. It's the truth. Don't water it down. Just speak the truth in love. Fifth, be confident. There is a lot of power in the simple words of God's, uh, um, simple truths of God's word. You don't have to shove it down people's throats. You don't have to get upset if they don't believe it. Just lay the truth out there in front of them. And in, and in its simplicity, the truth has um, convicting powers. Hebrews 4.12 tells us, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. A double-edged sword just needs to be laid out there. And the truth needs to be spoke. Sixth, be consistent. Live the truth. 1 Timothy 4.16 says, Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them. Because if you do, you will, be sa you will save both yourself and your hearers. Several years ago, David Kinman released a book called Unchristian. The book is based on three years of surveys that sought to discover people's perceptions of Christianity. Throughout the book, um, the findings support um, the hypothesis, this particular hypothesis, 
that people outside of the church like Jesus. They just don't like the people who call themselves Christians. The reason Christians don't live up to the teachings of Christ. And I actually have a good friend of mine who says this exact same thing. And so many times I've sat down with him just to look at God's word, to spend time in God's word with him. He understands God's word, believes in God's word, but the only time you see him step in the doors of ch uh, church is when his wife and kids go for a special event he shows up to support. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So leave this falsehood of the world and put your faith in, in the truth of Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one gets to the Father except through Him. We have to continue to remember that He is the truth. If we can't speak the truth, then we're not speaking about Jesus. Join with me. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for this day. We thank You for this time that You've given us to look at Your Word so that we can remember to keep the truth close to us so that we may go out and share it with those around us. That we may also live it out. And allow us to remember it in such a way to be that double-edged sword in our community. To reach all that we can. To allow the fields to be so plentiful that all of us as workers must show up. I just thank you for everything you've given us. And I pray you just be with us as we reach for the truth that you've given us. And I pray that we don't water down what you've given us. Don't make it weaker. Make it thinner. I pray you just use that strength in your truth to make us even stronger. Let's pray this in your son's name. Amen.